Thank you. Um, I'm going to begin with a bit of a mea culpa. Um, I will say straight out that my practice, Rex, we are just as culpable and complicit uh, within the myopia that I'm going to decry in these 15 minutes. Um, in my life prior to Rex, uh, in one of the first buildings that I participated in the completion of, uh, that building, finished in 2004, um, was one of the first buildings, in fact, it was the largest public building at its time to meet a Leeds, Leeds Silver rating. Um, that was an honor that it held for a very brief moment, but nonetheless it held it uh, for that moment. Um, and it did so largely to do with an innovative idea of taking stretched metal and putting it within the air cavity of an insulated glass unit. And what that meant is that the sun saw it as effectively opaque, and we could model it as opaque, and yet the occupant would see straight through it. And more importantly, um, on the interiors, you would get reflected light, i.e. no heat that went very deep into the space, allowing for natural daylighting. Now, this innovation uh, sparked something with our practice that we've been sort of obsessively pursuing ever since, which is the idea or the holy grail of a completely transparent building that yet nonetheless meets the highest, highest aspirations of, st of sustainability. Uh, a, because of the experience of it. B, because of the natural daylighting of it. But then also in combination with deployable elements that actually follow the sun, that you can A, harvest uh, heat in cold climates or uh, cold moments, as well as reject heat uh, during warm climate or in warm climates or in warm moments. Um, these deployable elements can also then combat glare, which is another sort of experiential factor. And we have taken this from uh, areas that you see here, which is a heating dominated uh, environment, to areas that are cooling dominated environments, such as Kuala Lumpur, uh, which we've developed an 80 story tower that has a veil that upon 5.30 every day, that veil would simply retract. Similarly, in an environment uh, like Qatar, we've developed deployable uh, umbrellas, sunshade umbrellas, that on a building that is oriented exactly north-south, as the sun moves from uh, the southern exposure, the building will simply transform in about two minutes. Now, this obsession took a very interesting detour about five years ago. I will say we still are obsessed with it, but that detour came from this graphic. Now this graphic, uh, I will admit, this is an old graphic, but nonetheless I think it makes my point. If you look at the areas in which we as architects, planners, uh, urban designers, what is our purview? Our purview uh, occupies about 50% of the world greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what I was surprised to discover is that we as architects and planners uh, and, and urban designers are myopically focused on the energy conservation, the energy usage of buildings, as well as their carbon footprint. Well, to my surprise, that's only about a third of what we're responsible for. And we're so myopic that we are effectively looking only at this and we're externalizing the much greater factors. And so I would make the argument, and this I would say is particularly true in the United States in which our cities are the least dense and therefore we also use the most gasoline. Um, therefore I would make the argument that any definition of sustainability is effectively rooted in urbanism. That density and diversity, the idea of funneling development, new development or the revitaliz revitalization of cities is the core of sustainability in order to increase nature, increase cities, and to re reduce suburban environments. Now I'm gonna put forward three very simple challenges. I don't think any of them are new. I just think they've been ignored, some of them, uh, for as much as 40 years. The first, growth boundaries. The second, the notion that buildings can be conceived not just as structures, but actually as malleable strategies that could allow for fine grain uh, almost organic development at a scale that allows for sustainable uh, materials as well as small investors and that those elements and those strategies can actually evolve over time just as all of our major cities evolved in their early creation. And then last but not least, the thing that probably excites me the most but which I think the least amount of real research has done, has been done to date, is creating uh, a decision-making tool. A decision-making tool that measures all these things access to population density, access 
to essential services such as schools, uh, churches, uh, synagogues, uh, libraries, hospitals, museums, and so forth, as well as taking into account things like infrastructure and natural geography. So I'm going to start first with uh, only discussing one of those because it's the easiest one and this is not my field, but nonetheless, it's an example that I can give, which is access to population. And the argument I would make is that we should not be looking at access to population in terms of distance. We should be looking to access to population in terms of time. In fact, we should be looking at it in terms of a time-weighted function, i.e. the square of time. Um, here you see just a general idea of take any point in an urban environment and look at its time catchment. How many people can it catch in 30 minutes? Uh, this is something that uh, used to be only available to data-rich environments like Finland, but now is available to all countries based on all of these route planners that we now have, and yes, we now know that they are taking all of our data and collecting it. So let's use that big data in order to create a decision-making tool. So if you go back and let's look at Helsinki, and look at any given point in Helsinki, and analyze how many people can you get to within 30 minutes of that point, you can start to rate the points. So here you see two, you know, one has 20, uh, 241,000 people, another 87,000 people, another point 66, all the way down to 3,000 people. Now, that in itself is not yet a metric. And uh, Moisen talked about metrics um, being the danger we should be talking about uh, experience uh, as being the more important factor. I am actually taking a metric of experience. Um, the proposal is, a very, very simple calculation of a time-weighted average function, i.e. the summation, of points relative to all other points in an urban environment based on accessibility due to time. So here, let's go back to Finland. Uh, let's talk about Jatkatsari, right in the center of Finland. And this is a map of uh, the amount of time it takes you to get to any other point within Helsinki. And here is a map of the population of Helsinki. And so if you took Jatkatsari and said, okay, 20 minutes, what is the population you can access? And you discount it by the square of 20 minutes. 40 minutes, you, this is the amount of population you can access, and you discount it by the square of 40 minutes, and so forth. Eventually, you can give that pixel a number. And it's a real number. It really has to do with greater access and less carbon. And that pixel can then be related to all other pixels in the environment, in the urban environment. And so, it really relies on this tiny, if I can point at it, this tiny graph here, the notion that uh, even if you might have access to a large population, the farther away it is from you in time, because as a good example, if I'm on one side of the Grand Canyon and I want to get to the other, I might be close physically, but I am very distant in terms of time, that that population gets discounted at the square of the time. So let's now go to a more uh, generalized concept. Let's take an urban environment and let's say we're going to pixelize it into a grid of 40 by 40. And we're going to, uh, just for the sake of argument, we'll go back. Assume that there is a minor form of public transportation here and a major form of public transportation. And now let's evaluate this location of uh, measurement uh, relative to the other 1,599 pixels. So the first pixel you see here, it's pixel 517, a population of 100, and it's 15 minutes away. Uh, pixel 1113 has a population of 300, and it's 15 minutes away. But because of uh, the minor form of transportation and then the major form of public transportation, pixel 1929 has a population of 1,000, and it's 24 minutes away. And if we do that, as a summation of all 1,599 other pixels for that pixel, we can create a true metric, right? And you do, what you would see is exactly what you would expect. A pixel that's far away from public transportation would have a low number. If you're closer, it would have a higher number. And if you're in the absolute apex, you would have the highest number. And that would allow us then to create maps. And those maps should be looked at in terms of population access. They should be looked at in terms of density of programmatic environment. They should be looked at in, in terms of infrastructural capacity. So let's take uh, three different areas in Helsinki, and you can see that literally it can begin to map into uh, uh, if, in fact, you can truly quantify all these metrics. And at the time that we did this research, we were working 
uh, with the Department of Transportation in Helsinki. And so, in fact, this is a true analysis of these three different points, um, that you can create let, uh, relative scores in which you see that accessibility, in fact, does literally relate to um, uh, carbon, i.e., the greater accessibility, the lower carbon, the lower accessibility, the greater carbon. And so how can we use this? Well, we take this kind of endless information loop. It's constantly being updated if the program is good and the program is also constantly being updated. And it allow policymakers, developers, planners, uh, as well as owners to make educated decisions. It's that simple. An owner who is uh, environmentally conscious will purchase or will rent in an area that has a, a high access score. Um, a policymaker will use things such as property taxes to actually drive development into areas in which uh, you actually have perhaps a, a, an anomaly, an area in which there is great access but not a lot of population. Um, using property taxes, you could literally say that one pixel, if it is a third of another pixel in terms of his access score, you would in, have to, in fact have to pay three times the amount of taxes. Well, that would quite radically and quite quickly start to funnel development into where we need it. Now, how else could we use this? Now we go to the second challenge, which is the use of growth boundaries. Um, this is not a new idea. Uh, Oregon has been using it since 1973. Probably the best example I can give is Lancaster County in 1980, not for environmental reason. Uh, in Lancaster County, it was done because uh, great tourism was coming to Lancaster County due to the Amish farmland. The Amish were discovering that their property values were going up way more in terms of their development value than their ecological value, and so they were selling them. And everyone saw that the very uh, the, the, the goose that was laying the golden egg was disappearing. And so they drew growth boundaries around the cities. And then they made a very clear argument. They said that anything that is inboard of that growth boundary has no development rights whatsoever. And everything that is outside of that growth boundary has development rights, but the moment you sell those development rights to someone on the inside of the growth boundary, you must put your property in perpetuity into a conservation or agricultural easement. And what that did is it would begin to save farmland as well as save ecological systems. And so what we need then, we go one step further, is to start to devise regional and international uh, trading markets, markets for the transfer of development rights. What I find amazing is that this actually already doesn't exist. It seems like uh, the notion that we have an imbalance between the value, the economic value of ecological resources versus its ecological value somehow has not been equated. And if we can create these marketplaces, suddenly they would be equated. Suddenly an ecological value of a parcel of land would in fact be deemed highly valuable on the same metric as something in terms of its economic value. And then the third challenge I'm going to give is the notion of creating buildings that are strategies, that they are not fixed buildings. Currently we are seeing due to um, the difficulty of development, both in terms of financing as well as the difficulty of planning processes, uh, increase development of super blocks, massive structures that are infiltrating not only urban centers but suburbia. The, the problem with these massive uh, megastructures is that they are highly homogenous for economic reasons, i.e. they are actually eating up all of the diversity within our urban cores. So the proposal would be, could we take all that development that a developer wants to build, not reduce it in any way, but actually encourage them to build it up in the air. That sounds crazy, but build it up in the air using steel, which is a highly sustainable material. Take all the housing and put it into towers so you uh, increase its access to daylight, to cross ventilation, to views. And what you leave at its base, that's the exciting part. You leave something up to 40 feet or four stories, depending on the environment or the, the planning jurisdiction that you live in, uh, which allows you to build using highly um, lightweight, uh, typically highly combustible, that's part of the problem, but lightweight, sustainable materials. 
and you leave this realm uh, at the scale of small development, so moms and pops, people with not large resources, can actually develop things and actually have them change rapidly over time so that the urban streetscape, uh, in fact, develops organically as we used to. Right? So the end result would be something like this. Now, all three of these challenges, I would say, none of them are new. But I will say, as a practitioner who is very focused currently, as I've said, on metrics, what I see is our profession is incredibly myopically focused on those metrics and not on the bigger picture of density and diversity, which from the metrics themselves is proving, to, in fact, to be the core of sustainability. Thank you. <laughs>